Who are the Congregation of St. Basil? Many throughout Canada and the United States know them primarily as educators, but they are also innovators and legacy makers. With roots in revolutionary France and founders who never intended on forming a religious community, these priests, students, and lay associates are often called the accidental order. But as Mark Twain so eloquently wrote, there are truly no accidents in the methods of providence. The history of the Basilians begins during the turmoil of the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. As many religious orders were forced to dissolve under anti-church persecution, Catholic education became scarce. In southeastern France, the Archbishop of Vienne asked Father Joseph Lapierre to take over the Catholic education of boys in an isolated hill commune. By 1800, the school had also become a minor seminary, educating future priests. But by 1820, the school was struggling. The newly appointed bishop of the area suggested that if the school's teachers formed an association, they would have his support. This happy accident coincided with a desire for closer religious life already shown by several of the teacher priests. And so on November 21st, 1822, the congregation's first general chapter was held. The Ten Founding Fathers, as the priests at that meeting are known, unanimously elected Father Joseph Lapierre as superior. St. Basil the Great, 4th century doctor of the church, became their namesake and patron, and thus the Basilian Fathers were born. In these early years, the Basilians were not a religious congregation in the canonical sense. They were an association of secular priests willing to live in community and pool the resources to support Christian education and preaching. The members did not take formal religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience until later. Boundaries were somewhat fluid on membership based on who lived in the community and taught at the schools. These early years were full of challenges and close calls but it was clear that the hand of providence was intervening when, for example, the local bishop, who was to suppress the congregation, died the night before signing the decree. Within a few years, the Basilians had grown sufficiently to be formally approved by Pius IX in 1863. Father Jim Carruthers is a spiritual director and retired director of ongoing formation for the Basilians. He recently shared his love of the Order's history while on the grounds of the Basilians' main stomping grounds in Canada, St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. Why did the Basilian Fathers come to Canada, you know, at such a crazy time in Canadian history? An invitation. The Bishop of Toronto in the yeah. mid 19th century was Armand de Charbonnel. He needed, because of immigration, uh -huh. had a lot of Irish young kids coming, English speaking kids, uh -huh. and he needed a, a school that he wanted, kind of minor seminary. He had studied with this Brazilian community in Annonay, France. He was a student there, okay. and he knew them, 
So he wrote them and said, would you come and help me? And they sent over a, an Irishman of all things, Patrick Maloney, who was teaching English to the French kids. And they okay. sent him first, uh -huh. and then three Frenchmen came over, I think in 1852, uh -huh. and uh, the four of them, the first school was in the basement of the bishop's residence down on Bond Street. Anyway, that's how it all started. And uh, they began teaching at his request. Eventually, they ended up here on the campus in which we're walking now, uh -huh. Clover Hill as it was known then. Uh -huh. And what was very smart of, of the whole group, wherever they had a school, they built a parish. Ah, so hence Saint, the St. Saint ba Basil's Saint parish. Basil's was part of the whole school complex. When St. Michael's College at U of T was entrusted to the Brazilian fathers by Monsignor de Charbonnel, they began looking for a site to expand upon. John Elmsley, son of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Upper Canada and a Catholic convert, offered to donate land on one condition, that the college must include a parish church. The Brazilians were more than happy to comply, and in 1855, ground broke on St. Basil's Parish. Around the same time, the Basilians were called to Windsor to take over a school founded by the Jesuits. Though the enterprise started on shaky ground, by 1870, the Basilian Fathers had taken over administration of both the school and local parish, Our Lady of the Assumption. Our Lady of the Assumption remains the oldest continuous parish in Ontario, though its historic church building was sadly closed in 2014 due to structural issues. From Windsor, the reach of the Basilians soon extended to other mission churches throughout what is now the Diocese of London, along the southern shore of Lake Huron, Though the Basilian Fathers were not always the educators at the schools associated with these parishes, their charism continued to influence education in these areas, and their expanding numbers soon meant they would reach minds and hearts in far-flung parts of both Canada and the United States. When I joined the community in 1952, mm -hmm. there were two higher education institutions, St. Michael's College, right. and then uh, here, right beside us as we're walking along, the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies. But in the meantime, they got invited down to the Diocese of London and oh. went to, in 1857, they went to Windsor and found Assumption Church and Assumption St. College. So there were those two, and when I joined in 1952, we had six high schools in Ontario. Ottawa, Sudbury, Sioux, two here in Toronto, one down at Assumption. And then they started going out west. Okay. And there were schools in Saskatoon, in Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver. Wow, that's a lot. It, it is a lot. But in those days, there were lots of vocations, and the Brazilian leadership were saying, we have all these vocations, we're getting all these invitations, education's our gift, let's accept them. And so they did. So those were the great expansion years. Because in 1922 was a great moment for us, because there was the separation between France yeah, and, and English speaking, speaking Canada. Yes. Because, well, there are many reasons for it, but in 1922, we were, uh, became the Brazilian Fathers of Toronto. Okay. Rather than the Brazilian Fathers of, of France. France. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. And uh, once that happened, uh, the doors were wide open. Wide open. Yes. Uh, and uh, 
you were asking me one of the questions about who are the leaders in all this. Uh -huh. Well, in our expansion years, there were three for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Henry Carr was very strong. Father Edmund McCorkle, the next general after Carr. And then uh, Father George Bernard Flaff, who later became Card. Archbishop of Winnipeg. So those three, those were the great expansion years. There were uh, lots of priests and scholastics, and we were able to fulfill obligations in all these dioceses. All those different places. All those different places. Wow. And it was uh, the great years when, yes, in the mid-50s, when I was still a, a scholastic, we were yes. about 800. 800? 800 members, yes. Wow. But then, of course, we're interested here in Canada, but there was the whole expansion in the U.S. In the U.S. as well. Too. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's where we went. And also, like, what made the difference between yes. being a French community and being a Canadian community? Uh -huh. Well, every place we went to, uh -huh. we had to adapt to the laws of the land, yes. the education of the land. Whatever the provinces. Yeah. Right. And Reg regulations. Father Henry Carr, Father McCorkle, they had to deal with governments uh -huh. all the time. So we adapted to what was needed. I remember in the 40s and 50s, we were all asked to go to the College of Education, get certified, wow. be right up there, because we wanted our schools to be on a par uh, with the public system. Yes. So we had to be well had educated, to be, uh, well educated, yes. well certified, yes. so that we could do our job properly. And that was one of the great, that adaptability. That's also uh, one, of, well for me, one of our contributions yes. to education. We were able to adapt to the society that you were serving. We were going to be teaching. Yeah. So with all of the all of the schools, all of the Brazilian teachers, how many? Just a rough estimate. How many students do you think the uh, oh. in, in you know since since the beginning? We're looking. I remember teaching. It was nothing for us. I taught French at St. Michael's High School for twelve years and. Every year you had at least 200 students, you know, <laughs> every year, and you multiply that with all the other classes and all the, all the other, other grades. With all the other, over the years. And as long as they've been there, since yeah. 1852. We, we've had an influence, that's for sure. And when, uh, when I was in general leadership, uh, going around the country, I, I was never visited any city, any province, where they didn't know Brazilians, Brazilians. in Canada. Yes. Uh, and the states were lesser known because we're, we're more widespread. Yes. But here in Canada, people knew us. Yes, yes. And if they didn't know us for education, they knew it they for really hockey. <laughs> yeah, sports was a really big thing. Well, when, you're, when you have all boys schools, yeah. you have to have sport. And they became quite good at it. You know, Father uh, Bauer, he did a lot uh, through sports. You know, yes. he was a very intelligent man. And, he made sure that all his players went to school, graduated, yes. all of that. And, uh, but Carr, McCorkle, Flaff, they were the big ones. In the almost 200 years since their start in France, the Basilians have produced some outstanding and distinguished men of faith. Three in particular are of note. One of them, a product of a Basilian education himself, was Father Henry Carr. Father Carr manifested the charism of the Basilian congregation through important contributions to Canadian Catholic education. A strident promoter of Catholic thought and academic excellence, he encouraged Basilian teachers to obtain advanced degrees and attracted famous scholars like Etienne Gilson and Jacques Maritain to St. Michael's College. Carr pushed for St. Michael's to be a federated arts college within the University of Toronto, a model eventually copied across Canada. He helped found the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in 1929 and perfected the federation model as principal of St. Thomas More College at the University of Saskatchewan and founder of St. Mark's College at the University of British Columbia in 1958. Father Carr's work ultimately helped to make Catholic higher education an option for all students, not just those interested in the priesthood. In 2012, he was designated by the Canadian government as a person of national historical significance.
Meanwhile, one of Carr's contemporaries was to become the highest-ranking Basilian father in the congregation's history. George Bernard Flaff was born in small-town Ontario, the son of an innkeeper. His history professor at St. Mike's was future Canadian Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, who suggested he could go far as a career diplomat. Instead, Flaff joined the Basilians, rising to the rank of Superior General and Archbishop of Winnipeg. Inspired by his attendance at the Second Vatican Council, Flaff worked for the spiritual renewal of the people in his diocese, becoming a clear and constant voice for the Church in Canada and beyond. As Cardinal, he was a maker of two popes and defied the stereotypes of that role, preferring buses to limousines and being called George rather than Eminence. In the same way that Cardinal Flaff defied notions of what it means to be a member of the church hierarchy, Father David Bauer challenged just how far a priest's ministry could go. Like Father Carr, Bauer was Basilian educated and a gifted athlete. After his ordination, he returned to St. Mike's as its junior hockey coach. Bauer later took his hockey prowess to an elite level, including as the coach and general manager of the bronze medal winning 1968 Olympic men's hockey team. He was named a member of the Order of Canada in 1967 and in 1989 was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame as one of the key builders of the game. In the 60s, the world changed. The world changed, yes. Right. We had a Vatican Council. We had uh, a whole psychological, sociological upheaval in the world in which we were living. There was Vietnam, which affected us here in Canada, whether yes. we like to say it or not. All those things radically changed. Fewer vocations. Okay. So there was the beginning also, too, of uh, beginning to find out it's very expensive to run private schools. Yes. Because one of our glories was be able to teach the first generation of people coming to Canada. Canada yes. That was one of my joys. As Migrants, at, at, immigrants. At St. Michael's College School, come in, all the first generation kids from Central Europe, from yeah. Italy, from yeah. Hispanic speaking countries. It was marvelous. <laughs> it really was. And yes. that, that continues because the spirit we left in those schools, I have visited them all. I was on the board. Yes. of St. Michael's College School. That spirit is still there. Still there. Of who we are. Uh, it's expensive now to go to a private school, but uh, Brazilians have ensured that there is uh, funding yes. for kids unable to, to pay, the, pay uh, the big tuition. Big money, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, it, it's, I'm very proud of all that and what we have done in education. You asked me also about our legacy. Yes, yeah, so what would you say well, would be, so we look back at what the legacy of the Brazilian fathers were, you know, in the past 150 years, but you know, going forward, the next 150, what would you say the legacy the Brazilian fathers will well, be? Well, you're like? working for one of our legacies, <laughs> like salt and light. <laughs> Father Tom Rosica, you know, has taken our charism of evangelization through education, our motto, teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. And when he was asked to start a radio and television Station. community yes. for Canada, English-speaking Canada, we were on a plane coming back from Rome. Uh -huh. And he said, you won't believe what they're asking me to do. I said, well, what? <laughs> he said, they want me to start a, a television, Catholic television station. Uh -huh. And I said, well, he said, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> and I remember telling him, you didn't know anything about a World Youth Day either, uh -huh. but you did it. So you're perfect, you're perfect for this for job. job. <laughs> That's right. And look where you people are. And whenever I see Salt and Light, which is often, it's Tom's name, CSB, is, yeah. the Brazilian Charism, it, it's there. Yes. You just know it. Yes. 
and it's going to be carried on because we, we were always adaptable. Like technology is, yes. is the main feature today. Well, our schools now, St. Mike's, the kids I see in, in seven, eight, and nine, yes. most of their courses are on computer. Yes. Which I'm glad I don't have to be bothered <laughs> with. I wouldn't know how to do it, but they're doing it because yeah. they have to adapt to keep up. Yeah. And it's education very competitive. And you want your students to go on to college, university, and so we have kept up and very proud of that. Yeah. And of course, Salt and Light is a way we're going to go. Yeah. And we're smaller now, and, and that's one of our big questions. Where are we going to go from here? Yeah. What do we want to do with our charisms? What do we want to do with the, what we did in the past? How can we How adapt? How are we going to go forward? And yeah. with the numbers that we have, what do we want to do with them? Yes. What will be best for them, for us, for the church? Today, the modern face of the Basilian Order sees the Fathers spread throughout North America, from Canada to Colombia, with Rochester, Houston, and several locations in Mexico in between. St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, St. Thomas University in Houston, St. John Fisher College in Rochester, and Assumption University at the University of Windsor are all post-secondary schools where the Basilians still call home. And at St. Michael's College School in Toronto, the Basilian Fathers are present at the middle and high school level, forming young men's hearts and minds in goodness, knowledge, and discipline. St. Mike's remains one of the largest and most prestigious private schools in Canada. Today, Father Bauer's legacy lives on through the school's distinction of having produced more hockey greats than any other school in North America, including Hockey Hall of Famers like Tim Horton, Frank Mihaljevic, Red Kelly, and Bobby Bauer. As the Dicastery for the Laity and Family Life reminded us in 2018, the very idea of being Catholic goes hand in hand with what is best in the spirit of sports. Through sports, the Church can play a significant role in building bridges, opening doors, and permeating societies like Levin. Yes, it is like leaven that the Basilian Fathers have permeated Canadian society, opening the doors to goodness, truth, and knowledge for generations of young men and women throughout Canada, the U.S., Mexico, and Colombia. As the congregation meets this modern juncture of faith in 21st century society, what will its future bring? In a world where the witness of the gospel is so desperately needed, Will the creative apostolates of those like Father Bauer and Carr inspire the new generation of Basilians to rise up in unexpected ways? Where will the wind of the Spirit blow as this order of dedicated men discern the sign of times for their congregation? If, as Mark Twain said, there are no accidents in the order of divine providence and all has a purpose, then we can be sure the story of the Basilian Fathers has not yet reached its final act.